right, everyone. Good morning. morning. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Isaiah. Book of Isaiah in the Old Testament. And the theme for the entire book is God is sovereign. The king is sovereign, right? And this, it's this major idea that no matter what is going on in our life personally or in the world at large, in our country at large, no matter how good or bad things may look, God is in control. That is what sovereignty means. And that's not always an easy concept to understand. Now, as Christians, uh, yes, many times we center our life on the New Testament, right? Like there is these stories of Jesus, and it's an amazing picture of God's love. But God's love is not the only attribute of God. There are many attributes of God. One amongst them is his holiness, and we're going to be looking at that today. This idea that as we look at Scripture, if all Scriptures are profitable and are given by God, then Isaiah is a good book to go through. So there are four major reasons that I want to look at Isaiah in the next 12 weeks. Number one is to enlarge our view of the king. Many times we just kind of think God is like a little bit bigger and better version of us. And that's not necessarily the case. As you look at scriptures, he is completely different. And that's what the word holiness means, right? It's this idea that God is completely different. And so when we come to the scripture, not only do we enlarge our view of the king, but we increase our love for the king. It sharpens our understanding of salvation, and it gives us the king's view on suffering. So there's a couple different things happening here in Isaiah. We see in the 700s BC, this was 700 years before Jesus, Isaiah was talking to the people in his nation and was prophesying, and he was actually a, a cousin of the king. And so here we have a, a member of the royal family coming and talking to them about God 700 years before Jesus. This was about 300 years after King David and King Solomon. And the nation was split at this point. So the northern side of the kingdom had all bad kings, and they got conquered pretty quickly. The southern part of the kingdom, the, the two southern tribes, they had some good kings, some bad kings, and they were just on one of their last legs of their, their last good king, Uzziah, and we'll talk about him in a little bit. Um, but it was, you know, it, it was iffy. Sometimes they would follow God and sometimes they wouldn't. And that's what we're going into. So if you look at the first five chapters of Isaiah, with this mindset of stepping into a courtroom, this is how God is approaching it. He is coming to them with some accusations, and it's going to sound harsh, and he's going to start off seemingly mean, but there's a reason for it. So let's jump into chapter 1 and verse 2 and 3. He says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Children have I reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. We get this idea here where he's saying, guys, like my kids, the Israelites, they've forgotten who I am. They, they don't respect me as their father. They don't understand who I am. He's like, guys, even animals know this. You guys ever had an animal and, and like a cat or a dog at your house? And they typically treat you different, right? Like they, they know that you're their owner. Maybe, maybe not cats because cats think they're the owner, right? I have a cat and a dog and uh, Luna just like doesn't think we're, she thinks she runs the house, but she doesn't. Dogs, though, our little Griff, if you've ever met our little feisty barker, um, part chihuahua beast, um, he, he, I will admit that with all of his problems, he knows who his masters are, right? Like, he knows that Melissa and I run the house. We feed him, we give him water, we take him out to the bathroom, and, and one of the ways he respects us 
he licks our foot, right? Like, that's one of his things. He tries to show, like, oh, you guys are the leaders here, right? Like, he knows who the alpha is in the house. I always say that to my wife. But uh, <laughs> he knows who the alpha is, right? No. But, right, like, animals know. They just know um, what's, you know, who who's their owner, essentially. And this is, this is the first argument in a courtroom setting that God is making to the children of Israel that his Israelite people, his children that he brought up from Egypt hundreds of years ago, don't remember him. He's the one that gave them the king that they wanted in the first place, and they don't remember him. He's done so many things for them throughout the life of the nation, and yet... It's so easy within a, a generation or two to completely forget who is God and what he's done for us. And this is God's first thing he wants to tell them through the prophet Isaiah. Next, we see verse 4. It says that they despise God. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, off Evildoers, children who deal corruptly, they have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They are utterly estranged. What happens when you have a family argument? Many of us have seen this over the years, whether it's with cousins and uncles and aunts or grandparents or even parents. When there is a breakup in a relationship of a family, it is ugly. It is, it is hard to watch. It is, it's cringeworthy, right? Like, when people get to the point where they despise God because of what he commands us to do or not to do, there is an estrangement that happens. They are utterly estranged. God says, all right, you don't want to have anything to do with me. You don't want to listen to me. You don't want to obey me. I'm going to be done with you. And this is what God is saying is happening to the children of Israel because of how they're living. And then jump over to verse 9. And it says, if the Lord of hosts had not left us a few survivors, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. This idea that as judgment is happening to their country and it's lying desolate because God is being estranged and he's saying, all right, like I'm not going to bless you. I'm going to leave you and I'm going to let what happens happen. And they're seeing God's judgment. And he's literally saying like, if, if God didn't even bless them even a little bit, they would have been, become destroyed completely like Sodom and Gomorrah. And we know from the scriptures that those two cities were wiped out in fire and brimstone, right? In a terrible way. Jump over to verse 13 and 14. It says, bring no more vain offering. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations I cannot endure and solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. God didn't even like when they got together for church. He's like, I'm so sick that you guys are living. I don't care what you want to do on your Sabbath. I don't care if you're going to call a convocation, a get-together, a solemn assembly to worship me when you're living this way. Right? Like, it doesn't matter if you, and in the same way nowadays, if you come to church, but you live a completely disobedient life to God and want to have nothing to do with him Monday through Saturday, but then come to church on Sunday and act like you're just going to be a better person on Sunday, but it's all an act. God says, no, I see through this. I see through your hypocrisy and how you're living. I don't, I'm not going to endure this. God even said he hates. They're appointed feasts. They have become a burden. Like He's like, you can have all the fellowship in the world, but if you don't want to have a relationship with me, it doesn't mean anything. Their holy days to God are vain. They're empty. Verse 15 says, When you spread out your hands, my, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. He's saying, guys, you're living such a terrible life that even if you pray, I'm just not going to listen. Like, that's pretty harsh, right? This is, this is a, a, in effect, like what happens when a relationship breaks and someone blocks the other person on a phone, right? I don't want to talk to you anymore. I'm going to block you. That's what God is saying. He's like, you can pray to me all you want. You can have some, you know, you can have your church, your 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 festivals, whatever, I'm not going to listen to you. 
I'm not even going to listen to your prayers. You can act like you're praying and put on your prayer robe and do your, your prayers however many times a day. I'm, I'm done. I'm not going to listen. This is how God gets with not only the Israelites, but I would submit to you that sometimes he gets with people today like that in the exact same way. How does he get to that point, though? Right? Like, that, that seems extreme, but if we believe that God is good and just, and he has a reason for everything he's doing, there's got to be a reason why God doesn't want to listen to people's prayer. Verse 17, the famous verse, says, Learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, and plead the widow's cause. When individuals and neighborhoods and countries go off the rails and they don't learn to do good, they don't seek justice, they don't bring justice to the fatherless, they don't plead the widow's cause, that's part of how they go off the track. This is part of the reason. God has given essentially a reasoning in a courtroom setting of why he's not listening to their prayers, of why he hates their church gatherings. But even in the midst of this, he gives a way forward. Verse 18 says, come now, let us reason together. I love that. Like, God could have been like, all right, I'm done with you, like what he did with Moses. He's like, I'm going to start over. I'm kind of sick of these complainers. And that honestly personifies us perfectly all the time. We're always complaining about stuff, right? But God is a reasonable God. And he is not one to just give up on us. He, he after having enough reasons to, to block us and to not listen to our prayer, says, fine, I'll give you another shot. Here we go. Let us reason together, says the Lord, verse 18. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they will become wool. Here is God promising in the Old Testament that there is a way to change, that there is a way for us to not be defined by our past, that if we seek to have a relationship with God, God will provide a way. Yes, in the Old Testament, you had to have bloody sacrifices, but those were a teacher to point us towards Jesus who would someday die on the cross to show us God's love so that we could have a relationship, so that we could pray and be heard. Remember when Jesus taught his disciples how to pray? I always loved when Jesus was praying. Some of the times he would pray, he would say, Father, you know, I, I thank you that you always listen to me, right? Like, and he's just, he's having this, this interesting conversation. It's completely different, though, 700 years earlier in the days of Isaiah when God says, I'm not going to listen to them. And the reasoning was, is because here, even in verse 21, he's saying, how the faithful city has become a whore she will, who was full of justice, righteousness lodged in her, but now murderers. He's saying, my people, the Israelites, whom I loved and brought out of Egypt and did all these wondrous things, they have gone off after other gods. They have done whatever they have wanted. They have hated, they have murdered, they have done all these evil things. That's why I don't want to have anything to do with them, right? When someone cheats on another person in a relationship, it's normal and natural to want to walk away from that relationship. And again, this is in a courtroom setting. Essentially, God is showing his people, I have all the reason in the world to divorce you because of what you've done in our relationship. Verse 31 caps off chapter 1. And the strong shall become like tinder, and his work a spark. And both of them shall burn together, and none with none to quench them. This idea that no matter how spiritual you may seem, all of your spiritual works, if you live a hypocritical life full of sin, and you don't care to have a relationship with God, all of your good works are like tinder. They will burn up in the end. 
That's not it. That's not the end, though. We're just beginning. We're going to get through a couple chapters today, so hang with me. Chapter 2, we're going to speed up here, verse 2 to 3. It says, It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest mountain, as the highest of the mountains, and shall be lifted up above the hills, and all the nations shall flow to it. And many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God, of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He's giving us the long-term view that one day all the nations will come to him through what he he is doing in Jerusalem. Verse 4 talks about how God judges the nations. He shall judge between the nations, decide disputes for many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, Neither shall they learn war anymore. God has an end that he is getting to. But as the king, he is doing it in a different way that we don't understand. Verse 6 and 8 says, For you have rejected your people, the house of Jacob, because they are full of things from the east, and of fortune tellers like the Philistines, and they strike hands with the children of foreigners. Verse 8 Their land is filled with idols. They bow down to the works of their hands, to what their own fingers have made. It's always good to look at your life at any time in your life and ask yourself, what am I falling prey to? What is potentially an idol in my life? An idol is anything, whether good, bad, or neutral, that we love more than God. You can love your family more than God. You can love your stuff more than God, your job more than God. There's so many things, and everyone has unique points in their life that they naturally end up sliding towards because they like certain things, and those typically are the idols that they struggle with. Verse 17 to 19 says, And the haughtiness of man shall be humbled, and the lofty pride of men shall be brought low, and the Lord alone shall will be exalted in that day. And the idols shall utterly pass away. And the people shall enter the caves of the rocks and the holes of the ground before the terror of the Lord and from the splendor of his majesty when he rises to terrify the earth. He ends chapter 2 with this idea that no matter what idols you struggle with in life, one day they will all pass away. And you will be humbled and you will see the idols in your life for what they are. Then he goes into chapter 3. Verse 1 says, For behold, the Lord God of hosts is taking away from Jerusalem and from Judah support and supply, all support of bread and all support of water. I have never experienced um, a drought or anything like that, but I have experienced one time in my life a shortage of toilet paper during COVID. Anyone remember that? Yeah? Yeah. I remember going to the store, and there was none. I was like, this is weird. I, like, I live in America, the land of plenty. We have, like, 10 supermarts within 10 miles of me, and I actually had to go to, like, three or four just to find toilet paper. I was like, this is weird. Wait, is this what they mean when, like, war happens and there are shortages of things? Like, this is, this is crazy. Well, God is literally saying here, because of their disobedience, he's going to take away his support his supply, his support of bread, his support of water, he's literally going to have Jerusalem and Judea like run out of those because God was the one that was supplying them. He was blessing a nation that way, and they didn't even see that. And honestly, this made me think of the fact that like there are so many things that, that we should be thankful for, that God blesses us in our homes, in our neighborhoods, and even in our nation that we don't even think about. Sometimes I don't even know until I go into a different country and I'm like, oh, they don't, they don't have this? Like, I thought everyone had access to everything like this. And God can take away his hand of blessing whenever he so chooses. Verse 5 says, And the people will oppress one another, everyone his fellow, and everyone his neighbor. And the youth will be insolent to the elder, and the despised to the honorable. So 
so here we have a, a, a grim picture of what's happening to the nation. They're, they're losing their food. They're oppressing one another. Their, their leaders will fall, and they will try to make each other leaders, and their leaders will be terrible leaders. And this is part of how God is judging the nation. Verses 13 through 15, God is taking his people to court. Verses 16 to 26, he's literally saying your leadership will fail and you will lose all of your gold and finery. I'm summing it up. This idea that some terrible things are happening. Now, you probably didn't think, hey, I want to go to church to hear a terrible story of what happened 2,700 years ago. To the nation of Israel. That's not like an encouraging pick-me-up sermon. I'm going to feel better. I'm going to go home and feel encouraged, right? That doesn't sound encouraging, right? We'll get there. Chapter 4, really quick. Verse 1. All right, let's go. Yeah, verse 1. We'll describe it. It's an interesting verse. And seven women shall take hold of one man in that day, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own clothes. Only let us be called by your name and take away our reproach. In wartime, in time of, uh, of lack, there, people run out of food, right? Like if we were to lose electricity and gas nowadays, our nation wouldn't last probably a whole month before there would be riots and people would be crazy and they'd be going around and looking for things and, and food, right? It would be a disaster. This is the picture of what happens when nations crumble and it's happening to Israel. And Isaiah's prophesying it. He's saying, guys, this is going to happen. And it ends up happening. He's giving us a, 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 a grim future. Chapter 4 is pretty fast, but verse chapter 5, God actually sings a, a song. It's an interesting song. It's actually a love song. He's saying, I love you. If you read the whole chapter, it's interesting. It's a sad love song, though, for his people. He basically says that his people are like a vineyard that he he built and he and he sowed and but the vineyard didn't produce anything. And then he gave them a bunch of woes in verses 26 through 30. And then he ends with saying that he's whistling to the nations to come and judge them. So here is God saying because my people the Israelites aren't obeying me, I'm going to call all the nations, like he whistled to a dog, he's going to whistle them over and bring them to judge his own people. He ends it by saying, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Right? This is something that happens all the time. In every nation that falls, that you look back nowadays, and if you read history, it's the same story again and again. And then we get to chapter 6. So here we have chapter 6. Isaiah says, in the year that King Uzziah died, verse 1, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. King Uzziah, again, was the last good king of the southern kingdom, Judah. And he was a cousin of Isaiah, because Isaiah was in the family of royalty. And he, at this point, like, you, you would have been in a position of being distraught because the one you thought that, that was going to be used by God to help save your kingdom died. And you had a ton of uncertainty, right, of what was going to happen in the future. And that's so true with so many Christians nowadays, whether you look at things at large politically and whether coming this November you're political one wins or loses, so many people are distraught and they don't have, right, they're full of uncertainty and insecurity about what's going to happen. But this vision that Isaiah has defines his life. And I believe that for all of us, we need to have a vision of God that defines our life, not only for ministry, and volunteering at work, but life in general, how you live your life with your spouse, your families, at work, that no matter what happens politically or in your nation, you are grounded on the solid foundation that is 
God. Come no matter who wins in November. This is what should define you, who God is. The, for the Israelites, the Assyrian Empire was on the horizon. The golden age of Israel was over with the passing of Solomon and the nation cracking in half. These were bad days. And so Israel did not have a vision of who the Lord was. They did not understand that, that God was king no matter what was happening, but Isaiah did. God literally gave him a vision where he saw this, probably in a dream, or maybe even in a daydream, where God showed him a bit about who he was. And he saw that God is king, and that God is holy, verses 2 through 5. It says, above him stood the seraphim, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. The smoke there in the temple reminds me, honestly, of the smoke at Mount Sinai. that When Moses received the Ten Commandments, right? God had a, a filled the mountain with smoke. He does that, honestly, to protect us from seeing him. Because if we see God in his full glory as what he's truly like, what's going to happen to you? You're going to die. Straight up just die. It's like when you look at the sun and you burn out your eyes. I have to tell my kids not to do that. You can't see God as he is. He has to protect us with a cloud or with smoke, right? Here, even the angels, these mighty angelic beings that other nations confuse with gods, actually have to cover their own eyes just being around God to not look at him. God is different. He is better than all humans in every way and all angels. Think of the greatest artist you've ever seen or heard of. God is a better artist than them. Think of the smartest engineer. God is 10 times better than them. Think of the smartest scientist. God is way more advanced than them. The, the best philosopher, the best teacher, the best king, the best angel, in every aspect, God is better than all of them. We are mere images, mere reflections, mere children compared to God. He is the Alpha and the Omega. Even the angels, as they were talking and singing before God, their voices were shaking God's temple. It's, it's nuts because here's a sensory experience of God filled with smoke with these loud voices ringing. And what is Isaiah's response? Woe is me. I think that's an interesting response. Because... Christianity today is filled with the image of a loving God. And yes, God is loving. Why? Because 700 years after this picture of God, he came down to die on the cross for you and for me to show us that God is also love, but he's also a judge. And I think we forget that part of God. Here we have Isaiah, who gets a picture of God, and his first reaction is, uh-oh, woe is me. Because when you have a big view of yourself, you have a small view of God. But when you have a big view of God, you see yourself as you truly are. And a response to God's presence is sorrow and distress. You don't compare yourself to others. You compare yourself to God. And you realize that we are all broken and lost. His response was, I am destroyed. I am ruined before God. I am nothing. 
And it's only before God that we attain our true knowledge of self. Here is Isaiah. It's interesting. Like Isaiah is, he's kind of like one of the most famous preachers of his era. This would be like um, any of the most famous preachers you know coming and before God, they're saying, oh, my mouth is unclean, right? Like this is how he serves God. Like this is, this is one of the most religious goody two-shoe people you will probably ever meet, Isaiah. And then when he meets God, he's like, I'm an utter sinner, right? Like that's our response when we come to God. And any time we just think, oh, I just need to do better when you're a sinner. Honestly, that's like, it's like putting makeup on a foot that's full of gangrene, right? Like it's not going to help at all. We are tainted by our sins, and no matter how righteous we may seem, we are full of sin. And only God can help with our guilt. And this is what we see in verses 6 through 7. It says, One of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken from the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. This is God's solution for our sin and guilt. Do you feel guilty when you sin? God has a solution for it. Your life does not have to be defined by the times you have fallen, by the times you've messed up, by the, the times you have sinned in your life. God who is the king, who is holy, is also the God who is gracious. He wants to make atonement for our sin. This is in the throne room of heaven. Here he's, he's showing what he wants to do for Isaiah and what he wants to do for us. But then I love Isaiah's response. Verse 8, he says, Then I heard the voice from the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and say this, and say to this people, keep on hearing and do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Then I said, how long, O Lord? And he said, until the cities lie waste without inhabitants and the houses without people and the land is a desolate waste and the Lord removes people far away. And the forsaken places are many in the land, in the midst of the land. And though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is in its stump. Here's Isaiah, and I love that he, he responds to seeing God's majesty and experiencing his grace and atonement. He says, I cannot but serve you, God. How do you want to serve me? This should be all of our reaction to God today. When you get a clear glimpse of who God is, God is not just Jesus dying on the cross. He is that. That is the perfect incarnation of God's love. But there is an incarnation of God's justice as well. And we will all experience that one day at the end of time. And when you get a glimpse of God's might and majesty and love and justice, our response should be, God, how can I serve you? Send me in any way and capacity to those whom I talk to and see in my life. Sometimes people won't listen to us. When you talk to people, it's very similar. Jesus even said, this is why I'm talking to people in parables. Because some people will listen, some people will not. Their hearts will be hardened forever. Some people, when they look at God and when they experience God, they want to have nothing to do with it. C.S. Lewis puts it as, you either say to God, God, your will be done, or God says to, do, says to you, your will be done. 
and your relationship gets farther and farther away from God. So let's finish with this. How do we respond to God's holiness? Stop pretending. Stop hiding. Stop pointing out your own goodness or your own efforts. You have to be real with God, right? When you stand before the judgment throne of God one day, and we all will, he sees through all of our religious fronts, all of our, our moments where we try to make ourselves look better than we are. He sees through all of that. Honestly, this is one of the things that led me to God in the first place as a Christian. I realized that no, how, no matter how many people I could lie to in my life or trick or make think that I was smarter or better or wiser or good, at the end, on Judgment Day, God would see through all of it. Now, the aim of today is not to show the, you know, how miserable Israel was going to be or how miserable you are going to be someday, but it's an opportunity for cleansing, for a fresh restart from God. One day you will fight, face Judgment Day. And that judgment can either fall on you or it will fall on Jesus at the cross. And that's your choice to come to him and ask him to save you. And then as a Christian, our response should be, God, send me. Ask him where you can serve in this life. God, how can I serve my family? How can I serve my community? How can I serve those you've given to me in this life? What gifts have you given me to serve with? Everyone is different with who we touch and with what gifts we've been given. With Isaiah, God wanted him to be a prophet 2,700 years ago. With us today, God has many different gifts that he's given us to serve him. So today, be thankful for your own journey. Be thankful for how God was at work in your heart today. And as you go your way this week, have that image of God as king, that no matter what happens in this life, no matter what happens to our nation at large or in our own person when we are full of pride and lust and greed and anger and sloth and no self-control and whatever sin we struggle with, that God is God and he cares and loves us, but he will judge us someday. And he desires to have a relationship. He desires to have us pray to him, and he desires to listen. But if we reject him in a relationship with him, he will not listen to us. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. This is a stern warning today. Not every scripture you've given us in the Bible is a positive, upbeat message. All scripture is given by you, though, and is profitable for us. Help us as we look at the book of Isaiah in the coming weeks to get a glimpse of your glory, to get a glimpse of your majesty, because you are king, because you are in control of everything. We trust you. In the name of Jesus, amen.